Thank you all for joining us this afternoon uh, for the roundtable discussion on new approaches to Cody studies. And having been a fellow here at the center and having been part of Cody studies uh, and the papers project for many years now, uh, I just have to say I don't think there's any better model for collaboration among academic and public historians, especially towards the pursuit of digital uh, work uh, in our professions. And the work that the associate editors and volunteers have done coming together to enhance the scholarship available on Cody and his Wild West is pretty phenomenal. What's available online and what we're uh, going to be adding, hopefully, after uh, these sessions uh, is something to look forward to. And we have many presentations, uh, books, and future conferences, all of that listed on Cody Studies, and also uh, digital exhibitions. So the four presenters we have today will talk about uh, their past projects, their future projects, uh, and how we can think about innovative ways to enhance Cody's studies for the future. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce all of them today. I'm going to do it one at a time because I think they each do have some PowerPoint slides to share with us today. Uh, so I will uh, get on with this right now uh, and introduce uh, John Phil Wall. Uh, John is the Senior Director of the Institute for Digital Intermediate Arts at Ball State University. IDIA Lab is a virtual and augmented reality design studio exploring the intersections of art, science, and technology. Welcome, John. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm in. Uh, I'm at Ball State University. Head up a, a lab there. We shorten and call the Idea Lab, and I'm just at the URL here. If you're interested in some of the work we do, you can. There's something with Cody right there, but uh, you can check us out. But right, we do work with a variety of disciplines, so across the arts, sciences, and humanities. Um, a lot of cultural heritage and digital history work, and you know, essentially bringing the past to life in different ways using new technologies and leveraging them essentially for visitor interpretation uh, solutions. So there's some, some good stuff here you can, you can look at. Uh, oh, it's tiny in there, okay. And I'm, gonna, I don't, uh, I'm not gonna use a PowerPoint, I'm gonna show you the actual works because that's always a better way to understand some of this because we are using these very emergent technologies in the service of, uh, you know, again, museums, teaching and learning tools like that, so. Um, I'll start off with the project that we did for the center here. Uh, maybe it's two years ago now, I don't know. But uh, essentially it's uh, using a game engine, so you know, something that you'd normally uh, maybe purchase you know, off the app store or even you know, a console game like uh, Xbox or uh, PlayStation, that sort of thing. But using that sort of technology to recreate the traveling show of uh, Buffalo Bill Wild West. And as our model here, we used, uh, and it, this goes back to Jim's presentation earlier, but we used the particular installation uh, that Cody had installed or set up uh, several times, but the, the particular version of the show that we used to interpret was the 1899 show in Muncie, Indiana. So we, so specifically it's, it is that show. However, we used you know a more typical and general kind of approach in interpreting it. So here you have um, a map that, as a visitor, you can uh, click on. And these little white circles are convenient ways to hop around. I mean, obviously, it's a several-acre site, so you walk your little character around and explore the show as if you're uh, a, a visitor back in that time. But it's tedious and takes a long time, so. Uh, but you can do it, and that's that's kind of the fun part, especially at first, and really understanding kind of the spatial aspect of the 
the installation of the show. Um, but those little white spots allow you to click and essentially what's called teleport to a, a particular location, like in Star Trek or something like that. So um, we used, you know, luckily, Cody's shows were happening where, you know, in an era where th there was a lot of photography. I mean, we hadn't seen consumer, you know, the onset of consumer photography yet, typically. Uh, Kodak Brownie came out in 1980, right, sorry, 1888. Um, but it wasn't until later that, uh, you know, the, um, or I'm sorry, the, the Kodak came out in 88. The Brownie came out in 1900. So we didn't see a whole lot of consumer photography, but there was obviously professional, you know, glass plate photography that, that, typic that was uh, typical of that era. So for our interpretation, we mainly provided or relied on photography, um, which was great for us. We're working in the Roman era. It's a little different, right? So, so we have to use other uh, I ideas. Um, this video goes fairly quickly, so I'm just kind of stopping it like a, a slideshow essentially. But we went back and we found a, am this is from an amateur historian, but uh, he did a really nice job recreating the trains that were painted for Cody's um, uh, system of moving everything around via train. Um, and we recreated that, so we worked with him and he provided us his assets and we applied them to the uh, digital models of the appropriate train car. So we went back and found what was appropriate to that, that time that he, he would have used. Um, and then we also leveraged as little vignettes into different aspects of the show that we didn't simulate because uh, the scale of this is quite large, but we wanted to give other kind of vignettes and glimpses into different aspects of the show. And so in, in here in this background, you kind of see a residential area. So, you know, at, at the arrival of the train, typically, you know, as they start setting up, they'll also uh, roll out the parade. And so we, uh, to get, you know, drum up um, at attendance and bring people in there. So we, found we, we leveraged a lot of the existing films and spatialize them in different locations to augment the virtual experience. So while you're in the virtual world, you can then look and get uh, an augmentation of that through the great uh, films that exist. So here's some of the parade material. And again, in thinking of a little vignette there to introduce that, um, ah, went too fast. But we, we created a little moment where these kids are peeking through the tent and they can look in, and that, that's how you see the film. So as if they're seeing the grandstand show at that point, um, which I think I skipped over too quickly. I'll just let it play, but essentially, um, yeah, this is it here. So here's, here's some children, you know, again, kind of sneaking a peek into the grandstand uh, show, which I'll show you a different version of in more detail in a second here. And the other thing I should point out is that these technologies have a great ability to connect to archives and database. So you know, connecting to the uh, wonderful collection here, the digital archives and such. Um, really anything in the archive can be brought out and integrated into the, uh, either the virtual world or some augmented uh, reality as well that I'll show, but tho all those rich resources and metadata and such like that can be integrated into the environment, which is, which is really nice because, um, you know, we kind of let certain technologies do what they're good at and not try to recreate them you know, with 3D. I mean, mainly the experience that we're developing is a 3D experience, but again, it's heightened by uh, what exists. What does that say? Oh, I see, okay. So tiny. So this is what, so that project I just showed you was the traveling incarnation of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Um, what we're now doing with uh, Jeremy and the museum staff here is we're looking at um, taking that into a format for the uh, visitors to the museum here that support multiple narratives. So uh, you can actually then see the show through various uh, personalities' eyes. And so you could see the show perhaps how uh, Annie Oakley, and this is, so I'll just kind of go down the list here quickly, but uh, Jeremy and the staff have identified uh, different stories to tell. So we have Annie Oakley, uh, Chief Irontail, Cody, of course, um, Wilbur Morris, which is uh, Naoma's uh, grandfather, and she told a wonderful story about him the other day. And, uh, but you know, to see it through a child's eyes. And then um, Nate Salisbury. So then uh, the idea here is that this will be a kiosk that so a museum visitor can click one of these stories 
and essentially you'll be taking through that narrative through their eyes and so a script will be written and we'll be able to understand you know how they saw the show so we're working on that um, so the, but we're also working on a much larger project as well for the museum which is um, recreating the uh, 1894 uh, site of uh, Ambrose Park in, in Brooklyn, where Cody was uh, for, I think, about approximately five or six months. And uh, they had a semi-permanent installation set up there, a wooden grandstand, and you have that uh, recreated here in a white model that's upstairs in a diorama. And so we're doing a couple things. We're, we're re going to redo that, um, and, but we're redoing it still as a white model. So it'll still look like a very simple, um, like an architect's model that they would uh, show to get, you know, kind of a buy-in to the project. Uh, so it still will have that aesthetic, so it'll be very simple. But we're designing a, um, an interpretation where you'll be able to hold up your phone or your tablet, and like a magic mirror, you'll be able to bring it to life and skin it in full color, and cowboys and Indians will wander around, and horses, and and it'll, it'll literally come to life. So I'll show you some of how that looks here. Um, but before I introduce that, um, what I wanted to show you too is that again, uh, luckily there's, uh, there's some photography uh, around the Ambrose installation of the show. Not, not a ton and not everything we would have liked. There are certain gaps that we don't <laughs> have or sometimes we, we see um, maybe a, a promotional poster. There's a little drawing of maybe some what the structure looked like. So we have to kind of do a little tea leaf, you know, reading to, to pull that out. But um, essentially, uh, what pho photography does exist is quite good. And so there's a lot of, you know, these glass plates have unbelievable, whoops, unbelievable detail. So um, it's, I mean, they're better than most digital cameras. So, I mean, you can zoom in and just get incredible uh, resolution out of these uh, the high scans of the plates that, uh, some of these came from the Denver Public Library, some out of your collection. Um, but here's a, here's a scene where you're looking at the, the uh, this, this enormous scenery <laughs> backdrop. Um, and behind that you see the skyline of Brooklyn, which we've also simulated, and I'll show you that as well. If we get back here. Um, and we're even going to recreate the nighttime, um, obviously they worked with Edison Electric as well, and they had several I believe five stations on top of the uh, grandstand that illuminated the show at night. So it was a nighttime show. And so it's going to be fun to do that as well. So you'll be able to see what it looked like at night with kind of the press of a button. Um, another view from the grandstand looking down. This was one of the most important views that we had for Carol and Doug and, and my fellow panelists for, for organizing this event and giving us a chance to explain how we're really using some of the scholarship and and methods that we've applied with the papers of William F. Cody to enhance the exhibits and the interpretation of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Now, uh, this, this story is a little personal for me, so you're gonna get a little bit of a biography along with a lesson on collaboration. So as many of you know, I was born and raised in Powell, Wyoming, 20 miles east of Cody, Wyoming. My mother's family settled in Powell on the Federal Reclamation Project around 1911. And here in Cody, my family settled in the late 1890s. I can still remember my great grandmother Johnston telling me how she walked as a young girl from Shadron, Nebraska to Cody, Wyoming. Now, Little House on the Prairie was on the TV at the time. I assumed, well, she rode in the wagon and she made it very clear no one rode in the wagon. They walked from Shadron to Cody. And this is the scene that would have greeted her as a young girl. And I just, I look at this and I wonder, what did they think when they hit this town, Cody, Wyoming? This is what it looked like. The reclamation project was just beginning, so there's a lot of sagebrush, dust, and uh, doesn't quite look like the agricultural Eden that Buffalo Bill Cody was promoting. So um, also, um, growing up, I heard a lot of stories about one of my ancestors, Johnny Goff, my great-great-grandfather who came to Cody in 1906. He was a hunting guide for Theodore Roosevelt in Colorado and then sent up to Yellowstone as a game warden and then migrated to Cody where he also worked for Buffalo Bill. He ran the halfway stop between the Irma Hotel 
and Pahaskatipi. So I was very fortunate to grow up in this area alongside my grandparents and every day was a history lesson. Every trip we took was a history lesson where they pointed out our family's role in this area and how we contributed to its growth. The center also played a very important role for me. As a young boy, we would frequently come here on the free days, which is always on a Sunday for some reason, and I'd show up in my, my suit and we'd walk around and I'd press my face on all sorts of display cases. So I'm, I'm sorry, Paul, you probably wiped a lot of my nose prints off. Actually, that would have been would have been Dick at that point in time. So, so Dick Frost wiped a lot of my nose prints off of the display cases. Uh, attended University of Wyoming where I studied history. I taught at Northwest College for 15 years where I was able to take advantage of the fellowship program here, the CWAS fellowship, which was generously funded by Baron Collier. And one of these fellowships focused on Theodore Roosevelt and Buffalo Bill's relationship, the enigmatic relationship between these two men, which led me to publish an article in Points West about Roosevelt's role in the memorial that was being organized at Lookout Mountain in memory of Buffalo Bill Cody. And didn't think much of it, and one day I received a phone call at the college, and it was Kurt Graham, the director of the Housel Library, said he wanted to meet with me, and he was bringing along the editor of the papers, the managing editor of the papers, Gretchen Adams. So we met at the Irma Hotel, and Kurt had promised me at least I'm going to get a good meal out of this, so I went along. And they asked me if I was interested in continuing my research on Roosevelt and Buffalo Bill, and I said, yes, yes, of course. And they invited me to become an associate editor. At the time, Gretchen Adams designed this system where we would reach out, the papers would reach out to scholars in different fields of study, different levels of scholarship, so professional scholars who were published in the field, scholars that were just emerging, starting out. But anyway, she said, we really want to bring you on board and we want you to look at the Cody relationship to the Bighorn Basin. I said, of course, I'm in, and started as an associate editor. Now, at the time, I started Bob Bonner, his book was quite, uh, quite popular, looking at Buffalo Bill's role as a founder, town founder of Cody, Wyoming, which was really contradictory to what I had been raised uh, to believe. Now, in many cases, I believe Cody was the town founder of Buffalo Bill, but Bob Bonner made the argument that it was more George Washington Thornton Beck. And George Beck was the one that did all the work. Cody got all the glory. And on top of that, if you read Bob's interpretation, the two men did not really get along all that well. And they really parted from one another, according to Bob, a as enemies, because Beck was just simply tired of the constant harassment, the letters from Buffalo Bill telling him to get to work, get out of the damn saloon, get to work, stop fooling around with that school teacher in Marquette, get to work. So um, I was really relying on Bob's interpretation as we were looking at piecing together the history of Buffalo Bill in the Bighorn Basin. Now, the archives here offer a lot of opportunity. The McCracken Research Library, and Mary pointed this out, contains a lot of archival material. A lot of it is very visual from the dime novels. The Buffalo Bill Museum also contains a lot of posters which focus on the, the public performances of Buffalo Bill Cody. There's also considerable collection of photographs and letters, uh, many of which touch upon Buffalo Bill's connections to the Bighorn Basin. But what I guess really surprised me when I started this research is you would think someone as popular as Buffalo Bill, that there would be so much material to look at that we would cover every facet of his life, but what I really discovered is there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of gaps in the archival record. Buffalo Bill did not have a private secretary recording all the outgoing letters like you do with the President of the United States. He didn't have a central repository, a, a major university that said, give us all your letters. We're going to start a traditional papers project where we publish from boyhood to grave 
one volume at a time. A lot of other archives were here. Okay, a good portion of the letters were here, but there were other collections scattered in other locations. So in, other, in order to piece together this story, scholars, and, and I have to credit Bob Bonner, he really did a tremendous amount of work traveling from one archive to another to collect a lot of this information, but scholars were forced to go to all these different locations. And through my work with the papers as associate editor, First year I met Doug and we got to talking about the digital archive and how important it was because it brought all this material back together again. It brought the material back so you could better interpret the past. And I was really intrigued with that. So we began working to collaborate with other institutions. And again, this is what Gretchen attended. So made connections with the American Heritage Center. The George Beck collection at the American Heritage Center is quite extensive, contains uh, one copy of his memoir, which I'll touch upon here later, a number of letters, and then a few years ago, a donor contributed a number of letters from Buffalo Bill Cody to George Beck, which Bob Bonner used to base his interpretation. So these letters, eventually we did get these scanned, and they were brought to, Buffalo, uh, to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, the papers, and if you'd like, you get a good look at this because I tell you what, my staff is outstanding because they can read this handwriting. <laughs> 15 years teaching, I still have a hard time getting through some of these words. But all of these letters were transcribed, and more importantly, we were able to date a lot of these letters because Buffalo Bill had a, a habit of recording the location where he was performing, the day of the week, and the day, but not the year. We have his tour schedule. So with that little bit of information, we were able to get the correct year. And some of these have been misidentified in the, the American Heritage Center. So we're able to re, you know, again, piece together this collection that had been separated through the years. One of my first jobs as associate editor is they sent me to Buffalo, New York in the middle of winter. <sighs> And I tell you what, I learned that uh, the winters here in Wyoming are not that bad. <laughs> so, but we began to collaborate with a lot of private individuals who held their own collections. I just happened to be a member of the Theodore Roosevelt Association, and at one of the meetings I met a fellow member, Shirley Hutters, who lived in Buffalo, and she noted she was coming out to Cody, and I said, well, well come visit us. And as we were walking around, she says, I need to go see Rumsey Avenue, because I know a lot of Rumseys in Buffalo, New York. And Bronson Rumsey was an investor from Buffalo, New York, so she wanted a picture of the street sign, and she said, I'm going to take a picture of this and send it to my friend. I said, well, would you ask him if he happens to have any archival material, any family material? And she said, I'll do that. Anyway, she reached out to her boss, Molly Quackenbush, who ran the inaugural site at that time, and Molly said, I know a guy, David Rumsey, who has some material that belonged to his, his grandfather, related to Wyoming. So I traveled out to Buffalo, and I met with David, and I, you know, sit down in his office. It was cold, and so I just wanted a big cup of coffee. He brings out this huge cup of coffee, and then he disappears, and he comes back with this plastic grocery bag, and he empties it on the table. And this material spills out. Canceled checks, ledgers, maps, some correspondence, photographs. I mean, just an amazing collection that he had in his basement in Buffalo, New York. So here was another piece, and we were able to secure this, thanks to the generosity of the Dallenbach Funda Foundation. We secured this collection, and this is now at the McCracken Research Library, and we're also working to get this online. In the process, we also came across another collection that was held by uh, the Goodman family. Ed Goodman was Buffalo Bill's nephew. And this individual contacted us and said, I have some wonderful letters from Buffalo Bill to Ed Goodman, which was really fascinating because Ed Goodman, it was pitched to us, Ed Goodman was basically Buffalo Bill's spy to check on George Beck. <laughs> so Goodman was reporting to Cody, Buffalo Bill, what was going on here with the reclamation development and the town founding. Anyway, we were able to purchase these letters as well, 
And as you can see, we caught these just at the right time. So not only are historians fascinated with Buffalo Bill's writing, but mice are also fascinated with Buffalo Bill's writing. So we're able to save these and get these scanned and prevent any further damage. And we're working to piece the, the material together. Now through this process, Lynn and I decided, Lynn House, good friend of mine who was the assistant curator and curator, acting curator here at the Buffalo Bill Museum for a while, decided to partner together to publish this memoir of George Beck, a copy of which was at the Heritage Center and there was a copy here. And Lynn said, you know, these two don't match up. Supposedly they're the same memoir, but there's a lot of discrepancies. I'm wondering if there was an original manuscript that's back there with the family and Lynn was familiar with B.J. Gerber, Betty Jane Gerber, who was the granddaughter of George Beck. Her and her husband George came out to Wyoming to Cody and they said, we're gonna bring a few boxes. Brought about what, Mary, uh, five, six boxes, loaded of material, and I can't make this up. The last box that we were sorting through, we came across this. It was a green three-ring binder, and as you can see, it's hard to see well, can you see that? It says, Son to the West, the story of George T. Beck, 1856 and 1943. And we looked through and we said, oh my God, this is, the, this is the Rosetta Stone of the Beck Manuscript. And it was really fascinating because what we got to see here is some really interesting editing that went on with the archival material. B.J. Gerber told me her father, her grandfather had a wonderful puckish sense of humor. I didn't get that from Bob Bonner's book. I think he was a grumpy businessman is my take on it. We started reading this and we write, realized she was absolutely correct. And what we noticed is the daughters went through here and you can see their edits. They started taking material out. And one of the stories BJ told us what I thought was so fascinating, told a lot about her grandfather. She said, my grandfather would always give us kids ginger snaps. And we love the ginger snaps, we drive around and eat them. And I read this part here, and I'm gonna read the unedited version. Two or three years before I made the call on Mrs. Hurst, I met Miss Daisy Sorensen, who was the school teacher in Marquette. She was living with her sister and brother-in-law at their ranch near our head, head gate to the, on the South Fork. She was very pretty and very young, and I maintain I won her with a barrel of ginger snaps. Anyway, I used to take her driving in my buckboard and she certainly ate an awful lot of ginger snaps. Now the daughters changed it. So they changed buckboard to buggy. They omitted all references to the ginger snaps. And on top of that, there were some other scenes you can see just the writing here. Other scenes that they stripped out, including a wonderful story about Beck and Buffalo Bill getting in trouble at Burlington where uh, the Mormon settlers there managed to steal all their whiskey and they were a little upset. The daughters stripped all of this out. It was missing from the manuscript they donated to the archives. So through collaboration, you can see we were able to acquire some really interesting new material, new archival material that is changing our interpretation. And, you know, I really appreciate the work Bob Bonner has done, but what we've been able to do is kind of test his interpretation to a little bit. And I think when Buffalo Bill was telling Beck to get out of the saloon, stop chasing that girl in Marquette, a lot of it was in jest. And you can kind of see this because when the two got together, of course, based on this story, they're kind of like two frat brothers on a road trip. So anyway, thank you, and uh, look forward to your question. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Our next panelist today is Doug Seafelt, and Doug is an associate professor in the Department of History and Research, uh, director of the Digital Scholarship Lab at Ball State University. He's also the founding senior digital director of the papers of William F. Cody, and since 2009, he has co-directed the William F. Cody Archive. In 2013, he launched Cody Studies, a digital scholarship platform. Doug. Thank you.
Thank you, Michelle. That was a great summer when Kurt and Gretchen uh, brought us up here, and um, that's when I met Jeremy and Frank and Michelle, and um, it was uh, a terrific time, and it really laid the groundwork for a lot of this uh, that we're seeing come to at least some semblance of fruition, um, although there's quite a bit of, um, as you can see, uh, ways to go. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about a project that I'm currently working on in collaboration with Frank uh, that comes out of our, um, uh, our most recent, well, the, the last two NEH grants. So um, as you know, we've, um, we're on our third uh, National Endowment for the Humanities grant right now where we're looking at um, the Wild West in uh, Britain and uh, Italy um, over the next, uh, it's a three-year period, so I guess we're in finishing the first year, moving into year two. Uh, and then pr pr previous to that, we did um, uh, England and um, Germany, where we primarily worked on the 1887-88 um, visit that, as, as so many people have talked about so far in our, our symposium. Our first grant was um, focused more uh, locally on um, Wild West performers like the Rough Riders and uh, the Show Indians. But throughout all this, we've compiled, um, as Jeremy was talking about, um, digital uh, facsimiles, digital versions of primary sources that came from not only the McCracken collection here, or the research library, but also uh, other collections. We've met, heard uh, stuff about the Denver Public Library collection. Um, I was, uh, when I was, at, I was at Harvard for a year, and I was able to raid their pantry uh, <laughs> for some things uh, that they had. Um, and uh, what Jeremy's story about the American um, Heritage Center, uh, which was uh, also supported by um, a Wyoming Cultural Trust Grant. So we've um, tried to find ways to um, continue to expand this collection and working with Laura Weekly, who's here, and others at the Center for Digital Research and the Humanities at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, we've been able to um, you know, use the technologies to associate these documents. This is the thing, when they start to talk to each other, when you start to be able to compare versions and iterations, when you start to be able to, uh, you know, hopefully even fill in the mice holes here, we can, <laughs> there's ways, uh, that might be a tough uh, task, but there's ways to find um, new avenues of inquiry and new, uh, hopefully new meaning and, and new understanding. So I'm uh, self-identified, I guess, as a digital historian. Um, I. Uh, it's one of the things I teach at Ball State, and it's one of the things that I, I practice in my own research. I was trained as a Western historian, um, but it's the digital um, methodology that I uh, sort of define uh, my work as. So when we're looking at um, trying to um, take a digital tech uh, into this vast collection and, uh, and uh, continually growing collection of material, um, there's a lot of uh, tools that have been developed recently to, um, uh, to assist the researcher in um, trying to uh, find those needles in the haystack, trying to find those connections and associations uh, and to draw meaning from them. So I was really uh, struck by this um, phrase uh, that came out of a document that we collected in our, um, our, our our last grant, um, the last of the Mohicans realized in London. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, well, this this cartoon from the Penny Illustrated Times, um, May of '87, uh, pretty much lays it all out for us right here. Um, gives us a roadmap to try to understand the British reading public's mindset about the American West on the eve or on, on the dawn of. Um, the Wild West uh, performances in London. So you see here at the upper uh, left-hand side, Buffalo Bill as the deer slayer, okay? The grand old white chief in the red and the last of the Mohicans. So clearly, um, James Finnemore Cooper um, is, uh, is on their mind. And then this cartoonist uh, illustrator has just put Buffalo Bill, uh, 1887, in the Wild West with James Fenimore Cooper from the 1820s, 30s, 40s. So there's a foundational element being applied to this new practice. So I, I was intrigued to think, um, well, how did this come about? Uh, what did the British reading public have available um, with London imprints um, when it comes to uh, work on the American West? 
So I set about um, beginning to investigate this. So uh, Michelle mentioned Cody's studies. It's not only um, this uh, in, in endeavor that we're all on together, but there's a, um, a digital platform, a website, where we are featuring emerging uh, digital, born digital, as they say, uh, research and scholarship. So we are uh, learning and applying um, techniques and methods and theories that are coming out of what is, is known today as digital humanities. Um, and we're creating things that we're making up names for, like digital research modules. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? Uh, uh, like book. No, uh, um, uh, we, we got a ways to go. Um, interpretive digital scholarship. You know, so there's, there's um, we have to compete uh, with this medium. We have to compete with, you know, online. We all do our online banking. We all do online shopping, um, you know, entertainment. You know, so there we have to carve out a place for scholarship uh, in a digital uh, medium. You pick up a book and you go, ooh, wow, somebody wrote a book. That's heavy. You know, that's uh, something. Online, you know, it could be the blog of the day, you know, somebody's uh, thing. So we're, we're working to distinguish that with these, this kind of terminology, and, and uh, Cody Studies is our, our, our platform for doing that. So the objective, uh, as Frank and I um, are teasing out, is um, trying to use what we call text technologies, um, these, uh, these computer tools, um, to think through, right, think through the American West that the British reading public had available to them prior to the arrival of the Wild West in 1887. So we're going to use these computer, as it says here, assisted methods to look at units of meaning, okay? So uh, y we heard about um, Burke and his, his, uh, his, his at marketing. We, we, we learned about the posters and the advertising. And um, so we, we can find different discrete elements of meaning that are embedded in those things, whether they're books, newspaper articles, magazines, or even the programs that the show itself pr provided to their audience. And in that, we can find, in the parlance of digital humanities, humanistic expressions and interpretations. Okay, sometimes they're buried, um, uh, but they're in there. And these tools are gonna allow us to tease these things or sift these uh, grains out to the top. So here's the methodology um, to try to get at the American West and the British imagination here. First of all, we got to get these texts, um, these books, nonfiction, fiction, all that that I'll go through in a second. Archives.org, uh, this is an amazing place that Brewster Kale has created to be a, a, an enduring digital archive for the world's materials. I mean, there's, there's video, there's the entire Grateful Dead live concert tape collection. Uh, <laughs> there's, uh, uh, and of course, a, a ton of books that are out of copyright and things like that. Uh, Google Books, which is a little more problematic with the lawsuit. Um, and in print copies that we have to um, uh, scan originally and things like that. But we then sort these texts into different uh, corpus collections. Um, you know, fiction by author, James Fenimore Cooper, fiction, uh, all the fiction that we're gonna look at um, by all the authors, same thing with the nonfiction, all that. Then we follow um, some of the interesting uh, and groundbreaking work of a guy named Franco Moretti at Stanford University um, what he calls distant reading, right? The, the trend in scholarship um, over the last, you know, 20 years or so or even more has been what we call close reading, right? We're going we're gonna to read this stuff at a very um, a, a discrete level and we're going to um, try to understand its context and all of those things. And that's kind of what scholarship is nowadays. But what he's saying is we can use these computer tools and these digitized uh, corpus of texts to do some distant reading, things that you, a single scholar could not possibly read. Your eyeballs would melt out your eye holes, and there would be no way to get through this in a lifetime, not let alone a career. So how can we leverage that distant reading and find then the avenues, the rich veins that we can mine uh, for the close reading? So we use um, a number of tools. Uh, Voyant is one of them. It's a web-based tool that is um, meant to give you a way to read and analyze digital text. So it, in, a, in a way, it's, it lays over that text and allows you to mediate your experience with that text. Um, we can model the contents of those texts in different ways by making representations uh, of its contents and then manipulating those, what they even call uh, playing with the texts. Playing, of course, in a very scholarly way, but playing nonetheless. We can use tools like uh, Mallet, 
um, it's a natural language processing tool uh, to try to create what we call topic models, clusters of words that frequently occur together suggesting there's a topic here. Um, and then we can employ other tools like Palladio or Gephi, which are um, basically, as we say here, data tools for analyzing network relationships between those texts, okay? So um, bear with me on this. So Voyant, Mallet, these are, these are tools that are um, free to use. They've been developed by digital humanists and computer science people, um, way smarter than us. Um, and it, <laughs> it allows us um, to not have to be programmers as well as historians, uh, which is a good thing. So sources, um, we looked at the fiction published in London prior to Cody's uh, uh, bringing, bringing the Wild West. So 1823 with Cooper um, up to 1885, got 35 pieces of fiction. Nonfiction, same sort of time frame, got 31 books. This is um, uh, the kind of thing that people ate up. It was obvious, a lot of these were published and uh, written by American authors, but they had London imprint. Um, we also looked at US and British newspaper coverage of the Wild West in England. I uh, got 97 uh, or 93 pieces there, plus seven newspaper uh, or magazine articles, I should say, which are much uh, more long form uh, stories. Let me just walk you through some of this um, really quickly and we can talk more about it later. But Cooper, of course, um, uh, known as the American Scott, right? Uh, Walter Scott, um, who was a big influence on his writing style. Uh, his five books, Leather Stocking Tales, um, that he wrote in two kind of bursts in the 1820s and 1820s late 30s and 40s. Um, this is a word cloud like uh, you saw this morning, uh, a technology that looks at word frequency. So these are the words that show up the most. We strip out the stop words, the ands, the thes, the all those kind of words that are function words. And these are the kind of things that you see popping up over the corpus of those five novels. So we can see um, some interesting things in here. It gives us some ideas. There's an Indian um, pathfinder, of course, but young man, time. Um, head, return, um, some things we can maybe start to, to start to work with. One of his, um, or, or, or another author that has um, great influence on a general reading public when it comes to the West is um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, favorite as a young man, who's a guy named uh, Maine Reed, who's a British guy, described as somewhere between a British Cooper and an American Defoe. So um, he, uh, we have 12 different novels that he wrote uh, between 1850 and 1885. Um, and he's a fascinating guy who he came to America and um, um, was wounded in, um, um, in, in the war with Mexico. Or no, let's see, he was wounded in, anyway, somewhere. But anyway, you can see here, of course, uh, across, across those 12 uh, works here, we've got um, some different kinds of things. Um, he's moving into, the, into Texas, Oklahoma, into the Southwest, um, whereas Cooper's obviously upstate New York. Um, so we start to see some different things. Bear shows up quite a bit in here. Horse, there's Patty's horse, um, uh, things like that. Gustave Aymard, a French guy who um, was known as the Dumas of the Indians, uh, also the Fenimore Cooper of France. You kind of see a connection here. Um, 17 of his novels between 1860 and 84 um, are, are fascinating. Hunter, Indians, um, Chief, uh, these are kind of things in Count. And so to um, move from s simply looking at, at word uh, frequency to try to start to look at networks of, of connections of topics, use, I use the mallet tool on this, these different, uh, at least three corpus of text, Cooper, Reed, and Imard, and ran it through um, uh, Palladio to then see um, where these topic models um, lie. So if you look at this here, you'll see these big dots, Cooper, Main Reed, and Imard, right? And then these lines connect these to these little dots, which are these, these topic terms that uh, you can see Reed is and Cooper share these terms in common, stream, wood, plain, um, animal. Cooper and Imard share these words in common, Imard and Reed share these, and then right in the middle, like a Venn diagram, are the words that the three of them share in common. So I pulled a few of them out on the side here, these key terms that might give us a sense of what the British reading public who read, whether they read Imard, Reed, or Cooper, these are the ideas, these are the themes, the topics that they would have had in their mind, okay? So that gives us a place to start, a place to now begin um, to go into our close reading. The nonfiction corpus, some very familiar names to, to all of us, um, who people who went west, like Washington Irving and Catlin and, and Burton and Ruxton, all these guys, Twain even, um, and uh, then 
this corpus, this is just what the topic models look like. Um, if you read it across this way, the, the algorithm has suggested that these 20 words um, have uh, uh, an association with each other through this corpus of 31 books. Um, so, and then we did it 10 different times, and this is kind of what you start to see. Um, just to skip forward, I did this with the, the Wild West programs um, from this period. Um, but I want to focus on the newspapers at, to end here. Um, the, the coverage of the Wild West in, in England and through the British newspapers, we divided them into promotional, you know, where we can really read the hand of Burke and, and others in, 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 in selling the, the show. Um, got a topic model, a bunch of topic models for that. And then the reception, the what did they write after the show, what did they write about the show, where there's maybe a little bit less of the directive from the promotional material and more of a, of a reflection on what they took away from it. So to, to take a look at this, we can kind of see now the two spheres, the hemispheres here, of taking those British newspapers together, promotion and reception, um, promotions on the right, uh, receptions right here on the left, and then right in the middle then are the things that they shared. So we can see some of the distinctions um, that we were kind of talking about earlier today in, in, other, in, in other, uh, sessions. Um, and then we can kind of see the common things. And these are just, again, I pulled a few of them out that, um, that, that bridge the gap of what I'm selling you and what you're buying, you know, what it is that you, you, you're presented with and what you take away. So, um, uh, I think it's fascinating and I, I think there's a lot more that can be done with this that I look forward to doing, um, in collaboration with Frank and we want to publish this. Um, first on Cody Studies as a born digital piece. So people, uh, I'm showing you static images on a PowerPoint, but these are actually dynamic. You can tease these out. You can click on certain words and see the text that it came from. You can isolate things and see what they're associated with. There's a lot of, of interaction that you can do as you explore now once these texts are opened up through um, digitization. So pretty exciting, fun stuff. Thank you very much. Before we're able to take your questions on all these innovations that we're hearing about for Cody Studies, we have one final presenter, and she is Rebecca Wingo. And Rebecca is a current Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow in Digital Liberal Arts at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. She is the co-author of Homesteading the Plains Toward a New History and is working on a forthcoming manuscript about house building policy and adult education on the Crow Reservation in Montana. And today, she will take us forward from curating Buffalo Bill and the digital archive to digital exhibitions. Thank you for being here so late in the day. I understand we're all pretty tired. Um, I would just like to say thank you to Doug, who was the first one who taught me how to do digital history with a fair amount of coercion. Um, and then, of course, Jeremy and Michelle, who let me experiment with my first digital project, which I believe was the first project for Cody Studies. So now for something completely different. Buffalo Bill was all about the crowd size. The bigger the show, the better the show. So what's more fitting for Buffalo Bill's legacy than the ability to reach an unlimited audience? The internet is a glorious place. Buffalo Bill's debut on the big screen, which is just what I'm calling computer monitors these days, um, it started with the Cody Archive. His papers, his art, his wax cylinder recordings, his show contracts are all available online for researchers, teachers, students, and the public, especially our citizen scholars. The students and the public are the main focus here. They are the unlimited audience. How do we then take an archive with thousands of documents and images and make sense of it all? And, assuming that we make sense, make it available? This is where Cody Studies steps in. Cody Studies, as Doug just said, is the uh, digital scholarship arm of the Cody Papers. The two digital exhibits I collaborated on and we'll talk a little bit about today um, were with Michelle Delaney, 
of the Smithsonian Institution and Robert Bonner, Bob Bonner, of Carleton College. Both had publications already. Delaney had her book, Buffalo Bill's Wild West Warriors, a photographic history by Gertrude Casebeer, and Bonner had his article, Not an Imaginary Picture Altogether But Parts, The Artistic Legacy of Buffalo Bill Cody, and that came out in Montana Magazine. Normally, this is where scholars stop. If they have their publication, then they've done their job. But not if you're a digital public historian, or not even if you know a digital public historian, because we have our motives and we're not afraid to press them on other people. So I took both publications and made them into digital exhibits. Now you may be thinking, but what about book and magazine sales? Aren't you cutting into those? To which I reply, what book and magazine sales? <laughs> I'm mostly kidding, but we're not Nicholas Sparks and this isn't how we make our money. So, you may also be thinking, what? what? So you just put the book and article online? Real cool, Wingo, real cool. But you would be wrong there as well. There is very little of the original text left when I get done with the projects, and that is both for good and for ill, I'm sure. Um, but as opposed to the books, the digital exhibits are interactive. They make the primary sources available inside the text and enhance user understanding through multi-layered and multimedia information. Our main media for these projects were a combination of audio and video, gallery interactivity, and interactive timelines. And I'm only gonna talk about a couple of those today. You can go online and explore the rest. In the Artistic Legacy Project, Bonner sat down on several occasions and gave what were essentially artist biographies and short gallery talks about specific paintings. I took this audio and I cut it down into bite-sized chunks uh, that reflect basically our modern attention spans. So <laughs> nothing longer than three minutes because nobody listens longer than that, including myself. Um, but scholars talk a lot longer than that, so there's a lot of cutting down to do. Uh, if you visit the page for a certain artist, and I have here uh, Irving Bacon, and you see here at the very top, that's Bonner talking about the artist, so it's just, it's kind of a longer form biography. Then if you look down here, under some of the paintings, you can see a gray box with a little play button in there, and that's where you can actually listen to Bonner talk about the painting inside of the text. Now what's cool about this is not that I found a free tool to do that, because <laughs> look at that was awesome, but it's that there are three layers of information to every page that we have in this exhibit. There's the text, the images, and the audio, and it's all there seamlessly integrated. For the Casebeer project, Delaney and I filmed a series of videos that sort of exemplify the divergence between the book and the digital project. The book is beautiful and crafts a compelling narrative. You should pick up a copy, and I am not getting paid for endorsements yet. Okay. <laughs> I like to think that the digital project is just as eloquent, but the point is that the project doesn't mirror the book. It actually more closely mirrors the um, thematic exhibit that Delaney designed for Casebeer's photographs. The themes of this exhibit included, as you can see here, formal portraits, informal portraits, outdoor photographs, drawings, and documents. The associated videos are interviews with the curator in which she talks about the themes, what they entail, and why she chose them. As a user, you get to hear directly from the curator about the exhibit that you're viewing. This is useful information on its own, as well as from a public history or museum studies standpoint. It lifts the veil on the process and scholarship behind curating an exhibit. Her narration of about half of these images, and I didn't make her do it all, we were there for hours, so 
probably best. Um, but about half of these images that we include in the Case of Your collection, and there are 83, um, the audio of Michelle talking about the image and why it's important is now embedded inside of the Cody archive. So we've given back to the archive and made it more dynamic. There was uh, some conversation yesterday about Girl Scouts, and so, you know, perhaps we left the site better than we found it. <laughs> so the, both of the projects have these interactive galleries. Using the Quesabir exhibits as an example, I set this up so you could sort by person, because we had, um, we have identified a lot of the individuals in all of these. Most of them, in fact, I think there's only two where we don't know who the picture is of. Um, you can also sort by concept. So these are concepts that Delaney laid out in her exhibit and in her book. Subject, and these are all Library of Congress subject tags. And then you can see there the themes as well. So the themes that Michelle laid out in the exhibit. Each of these thumbnails then links to the primary source in the Cody archive. So we point back to the primary sources, inviting more people to explore the related archival material. We generate traffic to the Cody archive. Delaney and Bonner had huge collections of images, and their publishers could not accommodate all the pretty and shiny things that they wanted in the text. And this is where the digital threat. After I finished the Case of Beer project, I asked Michelle what she thought. If she thought that the digital project did something that the book did not, if she was pleased. And she said, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what she said was she was really grateful that all of the images were there online and that she didn't have to choose between them because they are all valuable in their own right. And she made them available for people to use and examine. Now in the beginning I talked about the unlimited audience that we could tap through the internet and how pleased I think Buffalo Bill would be to have access to such a wide audience. It's not entirely true though. They are very real social, economic, geographic, and political restrictions on the audience, not to mention language. The internet is a glorious place, but it is not free. Furthermore, the if you build it, they will come model does not always work. You may have noticed that the digital projects I built look very similar to the Cody archive. We've got the Cody archive here on the right, I think. That's actually how I failed my first driver's test. Deb's giving me the okay. I got it right. <laughs> um, we wanted to signal to people that the projects were affiliated. And that point has merit. On the other hand, our scholarship should be exploding with interactivity. It should be on the cutting edge of visual design. The sites look like I built them years ago because I did. <laughs> Not only have my web design skills changed significantly since 2011, 12, I don't remember when these happened, but so have HTML protocols. Buffalo Bill was in vogue. So too should be the scholarship that emerges about him. It should maybe look more like this. Oh, let's see if it works. I do want to continue. Cannot load the internet. Dang it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Is there just no connection? That's fine. We can pretend. It's cool. I made a pretty thing. And that's part of the pretty thing, and then this would be like the other part of the pretty thing. So, the photographs and the artwork should pop. They should be what we see when we load these sites. They should be searchable as well as sortable. Now, the projects that I made are still extremely useful, but we need to keep design in mind over on the scholarship side of the Cody Archive. Archives and the publications scholars produce from them have always been different in appearance. 
This is the new direction of Cody Studies. We can be as web current as we want to be, and we will likely reach a bigger audience as a result. Not because the text is any different, in fact, it would probably be the same for these two projects, but because the design is dope. <laughs> anyway, those are just some of my thoughts on the matter, and I am gonna stop before uh, I invent any more work for myself, uh, so <laughs> thank you. We do have a little bit of time, maybe 15 minutes, to take some questions before we break. Uh, and I hope we have, we have the mic. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to you, all of your next projects to bring Cody Studies alive and uh, creative and fresh. Thank you, Rebecca, for thinking about the redesign. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, so it's amazing. I love it, I love it, I love it. I wish it had existed when I was in graduate school. It's amazing. But the barrier to entry to me to doing this kind of work seems quite high. Like, I often, you know, between teaching and advising and administration and trying to, you know, stay alive <laughs> on a physical level with food and exercise, don't really have time even sometimes to read books, much less learn how to do all this. So, you know, you, you guys are here and that's great, but what kind of institutional supports, if we sort of look, you know, you mentioned some things about, you know, the NEH and which may not exist next year and, and so on. So I'm just sort of wondering, like, let's, can we be real about the amount of institutional support that's probably required here? Can I, can I start first? <laughs> I'm sorry. I want to say that the center has been extremely supportive, and I was a fellow, uh, you know, at the time that uh, Doug and Jeremy were, and uh, they talked me through the methodology, they talked me through the opportunities, and Smithsonian and uh, Nebraska, University of Nebraska, and the center here came together to find the opportunity to make sure we could get someone hired, the wonderful Rebecca. Uh, to work with all of us to bring it together. So, uh, you know, it's the idea of us having to find the support and then also have the willing participants, but I'll let, I'll let you talk more about that. Yeah, it's a good question, uh, and it's a, a, a frequent uh, question that, that I've come across at, at several different institutions now. Um, and I, I have to just emphasize something that Rebecca said is you have to bear in mind that this stuff is changing constantly. So this isn't a model where I have to go learn how to use a software package. I have to be trained or go to a workshop or something. What you have to do is open yourself and be al allow yourself to, to want to um, uh, embrace and, and think digitally, if you want to put it that way, to be able to think like, what could I do? Then how can I do it? And in order to support that, there's a lot of things that are happening. And I believe the NEH will be around next year, and it may even have more funding than it does this year. But um, these things are um, valuable. Now, as you know, the, the papers William F. Cody was recently, you know, was recognized by them on their 50th anniversary as one of the 50 projects um, that they wanted to celebrate, as well as uh, uh, what Middletown read. Um, so th I think they do have value. And now to get this to the academy, to get this to people like you, or even to the public, um, I know there was just a two-week seminar at the Folger Shakespeare Library for early modernists, uh, at Europe, uh, English scholars, to learn how uh, to make network visualizations. And so you had people who just fell off the Shakespeare turnip truck and had no idea how to do any of this stuff, and they came out of two weeks of that building what you just kind of saw here. Um, we created a, a, you know, um, a digital scholarship lab in January at Ball State um, where we've tried to find those resources that probably do exist on your campus, but they're not really visible to people like you and me who go, like you say, from class to class and just keep our teaching together <laughs> and whatever it happens to be. Uh, but now we do um, these, these brown bag workshops, we, we do uh, uh, presentations, we bring people in for three hour workshops, we do stuff um, 
you know, virtually as well as in person. And, you know, Nebraska does things like this too. Um, and other universities do as well. Uh, American Historical Association, I know Rebecca's involved with the AHA on digital um, history sessions and, and, and panels. Um, the OAH, the Organization of American Historians, is having, you know, quite a bit of this stuff. And actually, um, you know, through the Technology Committee, the WHA, Western History, we've had um, what we call the six shooters, um, six minutes, six slides, lightning round digital history presentations now for the past, you know, three or four years. So it's happening. The worm's turning. This stuff is more available. And I think if you have the idea, you don't have to be the programmer, <laughs> you know, but, but you just need to be uh, connected to the people that can help you realize your, your ideas. And Monica, I want to point out, you're already part of this. So that's the, the magic of collaboration. You, I know you, you're a very good researcher. You produced an outstanding book. You're doing some wonderful work on Annie Oakley. And um, I've done the same thing. I've been working on Roosevelt and doing my research and everything. I didn't understand half of Doug's presentation. <laughs> and he was throwing some terms out there that I can't even pronounce some of these things, but I know I can count on Doug and Doug can provide this digital insight to help take the research that historians are gathering into this digital realm. So I think we kind of in the, the ivory tower, you've always been the, you know, you produce the book, you're at the top of your game, you can kind of sit back. But I think now what we're saying is through collaboration, you need to take your research, your work, disseminate it through the digitization process have Rebecca do her interpretive interpretation. And then John, who knows, we could have the Annie Oakley video game out there for you. So again, it's a matter of bringing people with different skills together to produce these wonderful products. So I'm a public school teacher, I teach sixth grade. Uh, and as I'm going through and I'm looking through what you guys are doing, a lot of what you're doing is moving towards a future where education is virtual classes, things like that. And at the WHA conference in uh, St. Paul, uh, I went to a session that the Library of Congress was doing. And one of the things that they did with teachers that was really cool was um, when you pulled the primary sources, they had a spot where teachers could submit their lesson plans. So they were able to say, hey, this is how I use the sources. They connected it to the standards that were going on there, and they submitted them to the Library of Congress site so that other teachers could use those lesson plans as well. Um, is that something that you guys think there's a place for in what you're doing in the future? Um, do you know what I mean? As, as far as bringing this to the classroom, because there's so many cool things that you could do with it, but sometimes it's a little daunting for teachers where do I start? You know what I mean? How do I get it done? Sorry. Is there a place in the future, sorry Jeremy, <laughs> for teachers to submit? Disclaimer, I am answering my, my own wife's question here. So um, as I always say, yes dear. <laughs> but, but that's something we've talked about and, and really I think it's another facet of collaboration that we need to work on is we need to reach out to K through 12 to see how we can make these digital realms a little more available in the classroom and I think you're absolutely right. How do we, we get teachers to engage with us and provide their curricular material, their lesson plans and share that with other people so they can then start using this in their, their classrooms regardless of where they, they may be. So we've talked about that, it's on the list. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get it done. <laughs> A lot of these uh, projects certainly can have a professional development component for teachers at a variety of different levels, and I think that is critical and important. And um, so I think, you know, whether it is an online project or a game or handheld kind of uh, experience, uh, especially the things that we do, we, th we think of them as essentially like, um, remember that show, The Magic School Bus? Some of you might remember. But you can go back and essentially have a virtual field trip. You can go back in time. Or you could bring, you know, like on the science or STEM side, and you go inside of a molecule. 
you know, wh wh whatever it is. I mean, but you can you can augment those experiences, right, with uh, uh, you know getting the teachers kind of up to speed on what's happening, and then obviously you know getting that into the the classroom. Also. I'd like to point out a different kind of uh, digital collaboration that several of the people in this room are already aware of, but we'd like to share with the rest of you. This is collaboration not particularly to students or teachers, but collaboration with the world at large. Uh, we are entering in we, at the center of the West. We are building a digital media center. We have entered into a partnership with Wyoming Public Media and National Public Radio. And we're going to have a national public radio producer, public media producer, here at the center of the West doing regular news reporting and taking the content that we have here and sharing it across all the platforms that go out statewide, nationwide, and globally uh, for audio production. We hope to add video later. But the beauty of digitization is that once you've got the content encoded in that way, you can use it infinitely, forever, and replicably on down the line. We hope to have this, uh, this facility on, what do you think, Chairman, probably mid-September, 1st of October? And we think it's going to be a first for national public radio and for public broadcasting. It's going to be a first for a museum to have this kind of collaboration. And it does feed into much of what you've been talking about here today. So that's, uh, th that, that's a bit of patting ourselves on the back. But we thought you'd like to know about it. It's not on the air yet. It's a great idea. Universities have had radio and TV stations for a long time. We're going to have one. We just don't own all the content. We share it. Okay, thank you, Tom. Any more questions? Naomi, did you have a question? Okay. I have a microphone, oh. so. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay, Michelle. I love you. Um, the throwaway remark about the uh, Annie Oakley video game um, takes me back to a conversation that took place uh, overlooking Loch Lomond involving a number of the people in this room uh, some seven years ago now, uh, where I was jokingly saying that the way to fund the project going forward was to get the right technology to develop the game Buffalo Bill and the Zombies, because that was the big thing for all the people that were playing these computer games at that stage. And when I was looking at um, John's presentation uh, and the way in which um, it looks so much like the sort of stuff that I see my grandson playing with. Um, I was thinking, hey, there might be, uh, that might not be too far in the future. Um, but also, um, I, I wanted to share the fact that, and it's something that I was talking about um, again that evening uh, when a number of us were there. Um, in Europe, we are much more comfortable with the idea of big government. And there is a lot of public funding that comes through European projects and government funding to institutions to do that sort of thing. My own institution has approximately a current rate of exchange $29 million to be developing digital campus for all of the university level institutions in Ireland. Um, and we are looking for partners because international partners across Europe and across the United States and elsewhere in the world is a way for us to leverage in funding from these big government projects that we are much more comfortable with. So I just wanted to remind everyone that before someone else runs away and does develop Buffalo Bill and the uh, zombies, that I thought of it first. Um, but I did, I was very, very much heartened by uh, what I saw in John's presentation. And I do think linking back to uh, Jeremy's boss's question, um, uh, I do think that that whole digital campus thing and the whole idea of game-based learning uh, is something that we could maybe be looking at in terms of how we go forward so that we've got teaching and learning that is really focused on these digital natives that the, the younger learners are now. Um, and we can really use these sort of technologies um, as a means of ensuring uh, that scholarship does really underpin teaching and learning in a way that the learners understand.
Well, it, it was uh, to John, and uh, it's been a couple of years since we've been working on this virtual uh, reality of the Wild West show. And for many years, I tried to, in my own mind, figure out how it all worked, uh, watching movies like Annie Oakley with uh, Barbara Stanwyck or uh, looking at photographs. And when we got into it, uh, we had a much different idea at first than John and the group ended up with after they'd worked on it for a couple of years. And, and I, I want to know a little bit more about exactly how that happened, and I think everybody else would too, because it turned out to be a different picture at the end of your research than it was at first. Right, so the first uh, incarnation of the project, again, was the uh, simulation of the traveling show. And we thought of that as a first person experience that you can go in and walk through that. Um, a as, as we went through that experience working with the museum, we, and, and actually all the other museums too, we went through natural history and Native American and such. And we looked for other opportunities that maybe these technologies could be um, applied to and help, uh, you know, again, tease out a more robust interpretation experience, uh, connecting to the archive and such as well. So um, we thought about that diorama, which is which is loved, but also is you know it has a simplification kind of aspect to how it's uh, designed. But we thought there'd be a perfect opportunity uh, for the technology to bring that to life. So uh, the museum was open to it, and we kind of went from there on a second level of the project, and so. That also moved into other things with you know, working with Doug on his maps project. And um, I didn't really get into that, but in working with Doug on that in the, uh, the map with the push pins. So we're looking at um, elevating that as well. So again, I think that's just what happens in a collaboration and you know, building relationships is it, it grows and can evolve. And I think as long as everybody's open to that, that possibility, uh, you, you can do some exciting things. <laughs> Yeah, Naoma, um, just to build upon what John was saying, the first module we developed, this was really before we, the papers moved to the Buffalo Bill Museum. So the first version was really designed more for an online user. So someone at home on their computer who wanted to kind of play around and go through Buffalo Bill's Wild West. When we assumed uh, the curator position over the Buffalo Bill Museum, we got to thinking, if we had that type of setup in the museum galleries, one kid would get on there and would be there forever, and you'd have a line of people kind of looking over his shoulder. So that's why we sit, uh, decided to go over towards the, the tour guides. So we create more of an interactive experience to where you take, you're, taking on a, you're taking on a tour, about a two, three minute tour, so you can see the tour, and then kind of walk away. What we're hoping is design something that then they can take this away, upload it to their phone, and then go home and play with it and explore it in further detail. But again, we have about a two minute time lapse here for many of our visitors to kind of engage with those exhibits. And then um, when we started looking at the diorama, that was when John came up with the idea of this augmented reality and as you know, in the Buffalo Bill Museum Advisory Board, we've talked a lot about punching that model up. As Ron Hills affectionately calls it, it's the snow cone model of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. <laughs> so we wanted the color, the, the dynamics of Buffalo Bill's Wild West, and, and some action. Because really, that's what Buffalo Bill's Wild West was all about. And I think just even hinting at that, giving a people a little bit of a taste of it, really drives it home. Um, instead of sitting over a white model trying to imagine what it would have been like. Thank you all. Thank you for the great questions. We do hope that you all go on to CodyStudies.org, see what's there, continue the collaborations with us, think about your academic research and how we can get it to the next level and to an even broader public. So thank you all. <laughs>